Hey, everybody, welcome back. So Saturday afternoon is always the, the toughest time at conferences because, you know, we've had our bellies full and it's sunny outside. It's like, ah, uh, but the Spirit of God is always faithful and it'll be all right. So <clears throat> many of you have asked again how to stay in touch, where are there more teachings. So obviously on my website, GodHealsPTSD.com, the Facebook page, God Heals PTSD. But uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, I was blessed to be invited to come sp to do an interview with Sid Roth on his show. And so I did an interview with him. And afterwards, they asked me if I would do a 14-episode TV show on his network. So the uh, show is called uh, Living Unbroken. And I just want to show you the opening trailer to it just so you get an idea of, of what it looks like. So if we could show that video, that'd be great. Trauma, past memories, PTSD. Are the events from your past affecting the way you think, feel, and make choices? What is your true identity? What does God say about you? Access the power of God to bring healing and restoration to every area of your life. The good news is that Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted and restore the shattered soul. Welcome to Living Unbroken with Dr. Mike Hutchings. Actually, you can access this on two different platforms. First of all, Sid Roth has a network called It's Supernatural Network. He has an app called ISN. If you go onto uh, your app stores and look for ISN or It's Supernatural Network, you can download that app. And, and I'm about eight shows down from the top. Uh, where you, there's 14 episodes that deal with God's provision for healing all sorts of traumas. We have lots of interviews and, and um, just information on that. Also, if you're familiar with the Rumble app, the Rumble social media app, and there's actually a channel on the Rumble social media app uh, called Living Unbroken. And you can download any, both on ISN as well as on the Rumble social media app, you can download all of those uh, episodes and share them with your friends. I mean, it, it's an open sharing thing. So there's, there's different ones on military trauma, on sexual trauma, on grief and loss. Uh, there's lots of different shows. I, um, the, the one book that I have out there, Dale Mast, who is a prophet, he wrote an amazing book on David, and David perceived he was king. The one out there on getting free from the limitations of pain, I did an interview with him. But uh, feel free to share. Just, just go for it, and you'll learn. Uh, I have just some additional things in those episodes that I'm not able to share. I went after one episode because I filmed it in the midst of COVID and I went after the trauma that we got from COVID. How many of you were traumatized by COVID? Anybody? How many of you had COVID and got traumatized by it? Anybody? You know, the confusion, the fog, the brain fog and all of this stuff, that all, that's all trauma. And uh, I have one episode just to talk about that there. So anyway, that's that. Also, I'm aware that we have a number of therapists counselors, psychologists, as well as uh, pastors that are here. And a few of you have come up to me and say, okay, how do I integrate this into uh, my practice, what I do? So when we're done at four o'clock today, once I get done with the impartation, we're going to have a meeting in the lobby beyond, there's, uh, there's gates back there. And if you, only if you're a therapist, counselor, uh, a, a counseling professional, psychologist, psychiatrist, or a pastor, we're going to have a very brief meeting, maybe 20 minutes at length, uh, just to give you some tips about how to integrate the healing prayer model into your practice. And I'm, I'm just so thankful that you're here. And once again, would you give it up for all those amazing people who are giving themselves? <clears throat> so the next two hours, we're going to walk through 
the healing prayer model, and you all have uh, the notes. Um, who came and you do not have the notes for the healing prayer model? Would you raise your hand? Anybody? Everybody have one? There's one back there. Greg, one, two, there's a couple back here. So if you keep your hand raised, and they will get, give the, just keep your hand raised the whole time uh, until you get notes handed to you. So we get to start off with testimonies this afternoon. Who loves testimonies? Anybody? So the very first one is actually not my testimony. It is uh, Randy Clark was doing a meeting at a African-American church in Springfield, Ohio. It was the first time he'd been there. And how many of you have ever seen Randy Clark minister before healing? Anybody? Okay, so most of you have. You know that his primary vehicle is words of knowledge. So at the end of the message, he started giving out words of knowledge, and nobody was standing up. And as you know, in order to raise faith in the room, you have to have people stand up to, to raise faith. Guys, keep your hands raised if you need notes, okay? Keep your hands raised for those. I don't know if they, they may have gone and made more copies. Yeah, I don't see any of them here, so we'll, hopefully they'll get back here in a little bit. Um, so what they finally, dis okay, here come more notes. If you don't have notes, raise your hands. We'll post them online. We don't have, I'm going to get a few more. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll post them online. Okay, good. Um, and finally, one gentleman finally stood up, and he says he refused to stand up, even though most of the words of knowledge were for him, because he was skeptical. So let's show, number one, this is George in Springfield, Ohio, and this is Randy Clark. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is George. I had two situations, um, 24 years coming out from the military, had surgery, um, from being in war, um, I had uh, an invisible plate that was put into my shoulder was one of the problems. The other one was myalgia. And most of the people that uh, that's just recently seen me, I couldn't really move my arms. But tonight, I felt some heat. I, I was really skeptical. But I felt some heat going through my shoulders. So he said, do something that you couldn't do. I said, okay, something that I couldn't do, I couldn't do push-ups because I had been bound because of the surgery and because of the, the myalgia, remember, because he was praying for me. So then when I felt the heat, then I, I got down. do that um, and which it was kind of weird because he said Achilles tendon I said no nah, I'm not gonna stand up for the Achilles tendon <laughs> then he said the wrist nah I'm not gonna stand up for the wrist then he started talking about the hands I said no nah, my hands hurt too so I'm not gonna stand up for that <laughs> so he said the hip my sciatic nerve hurt too so I've been having issues for a long time like I said for 24 years of service and, um, and I, I just really thank God. I'm, I'm, anybody that know, I'm not no phony, but I'll tell you something. Anybody that got that myalgia, let me tell you something. That, you cannot sleep. You cannot, you do not have any comfort at all with that myalgia. It hurts you all day long. You, I'm t I be up all night long saying, God, please heal me. Heal my body, God. I need some rest. I need some deliverance. Please, God, please come see about me. I'm telling you, I, I'm telling you, anybody that get that, please pray for them because that is serious. And that's all I got to say in Jesus' name. Amen. So although PTSD wasn't mentioned there, George realized that what he was suffering from was post-traumatic stress from all of his years in service being deployed multiple times in some very serious military zones. He was special forces. Um, and so they have a whole another level of trauma that most of us really don't understand unless you've been in with those amazing people. But uh, he actually started going after the veterans in his own church and getting them healed. 
uh, which many of them suffered from fibromyalgia. So that gives you an idea of what happens to the body uh, that carries a lot of unhealed trauma. So uh, as I said at the beginning and last night that I got into this whole thing of praying for trauma because Randy Clark assigned me to pray for a military veteran and he, he got healed and it was wonderful. But I honestly thought that it was a one time deal. I was like, okay, well, I prayed for a knee and a knee got healed. You don't go around doing seminars how to pray for knees, right? I mean, you just, <laughs> but this is what Randy would do to me. We would go on, we do these healing trips and we go on conferences and in the midst of going into ministry, Randy would say, hey, Mike, come up here and share a testimony how somebody got healed of PTSD. So I'd get up there and, and guys, you have to understand something. I had no clue what I was doing. But I would get up and I'd give a testimony, and this is what my friend Randy Clark would do to me. He'd say, okay, everybody who's got PTSD, come down and let Mike pray for you. <laughs> and I proved what my friend Bishop Joseph Garlington says, that God never calls the qualified. He always qualifies the call. So I'm just going to say to you, even though I have years in, in, in ministry, I have years in, in counseling, I really had no clue what I was doing because trauma had never been a focus for me. PTSD was something I know very little about, except I knew that my uncle and my dad and some of my uncles suffered with trauma from, from the war. But uh, it was one of those things that I knew nothing about, but I literally learned on-the-job training how to pray for people. So I prayed for the guy in Illinois, and the next January, we we're in Bethel Church for the annual School of Healing and Impartation. And uh, I'm out in the foyer, talk, Randy's doing ministry up front there at the Reading uh, Civic Center. And uh, I'm actually out in the foyer talking with some people, but they got the door open. And all of a sudden, I hear Randy from the stage say, my cutchings, my cutchings. Has anybody seen my cutchings? Somebody go and get my cutchings. Now, this is where you know that I have ants in my brain, too. <laughs> because when your boss is calling out your name in front of 2,500 people, what's the first thing you, sent, you think? Oh, my gosh, what have I done wrong now, right? <laughs> Uh-oh. So I, I run up to the stage, and Randy's got, he's on his knees on the stage, and he's holding this guy's hand that's kind of like standing here, and Randy's here, and he's holding this guy's hand. And I get up to the stage, I say, Randy, what do you need? And he says, I think this guy needs for you to pray for him. So uh, this next video, number three, which is Adrian at Bethel Church in Redding, California, it's about a 10-minute long testimony, but actually will help us introduce how to bring healing prayer to people with trauma. So uh, let's, so about seven minutes in, Randy will try to close off the, the testimony because it's time to move on, but yet there's another piece to the testimony that's pretty amazing. So let's show video number three, Adrian at Bethel Church in Redding, California. Hey, how you doing? I'm great. Let me tell you first about what happened a few weeks ago and then what happened, and I'll let Adrian tell about last night. How many uh, veterans of the uh, wars in the Middle East do we have in our presence tonight? If you've served in Iraq or Afghanistan, somewhere in the Middle East, would you just lift your hand once we have any? Um... <laughs> you know, this war, like all wars, has casualties, sometimes it's more than shrapnel. And one of the huge things that we're facing as a country is so many uh, veterans coming back with PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And a few, uh, several weeks ago, uh, a young man came up to us in Illinois at a large vineyard, and he, he, he told me, um, you gotta pray for me. I've, Ever since I came back from Iraq, I've had night sweats, and I've had terrible dreams, and I've been tormented every night, and my life has been miserable, and it's, uh, and, and, 
So, and it's, it's so bad, his wife is going to have to have surgery as well. And so Mike, our director of our school, he, uh, he was with me. I said, Mike, pray. And as he began to pray, something happened to this man named Ron, who was a veteran. And the next day, he met us and said, I had no night terrors, no night sweats. I have been at peace. And my wife was healed when she was facing back surgery for in her lumbar area. She got healed at the same time. This is now weeks later, we're still getting emails from him. And not only that, but he has such, had such a healing, not one problem since then, that he is praying for all the veterans in the church that they too would be healed of the PTSD. So last, was it last night you came up? Monday. Monday night, Adrian here came up, I believe it was right there, or somewhere right in there. And I knelt down and I asked, what do you need? And, and he told me, so you take it from there and tell us what's happened. Well, Monday night when Mr. Clark was handing out the books, he had handed out a book on identity, and that's why I had to get to him. And I knew I could went to the bookstore and get it, but something kept telling me, no, you need to go ask Randy Clark what the title of that book was, and you need to ask him specifically. And I was like, no, no, I'm just going to go to the bookstore. But anyway, I made my way up here. The, the crowds parted like the Red Sea because I didn't know how I was getting here. And... I asked him the title of the book, and he told me, and he said, well, why do you need it? I said, I lost my identity quite a few wars ago, and I was trying to find myself. And he said, you don't need that book. Let me call up a team member to pray for you. But what was even better was that I think, I don't know, I'm speaking on your behalf, but I feel that he sensed that if he left me to wait for the team member, I was bolting for the door because I was scared, I was terrified, I was getting surrounded by the crowds, I was nervous, I wanted to get out of here, I was looking for a threat. But he didn't let me go, he took his mic off and he sat with me. Can't thank you enough for doing that for me. Before I go on, there is freedom in Jesus. <clears throat> I didn't come here to get prayer for PTSD. I've come here because I've been living with chronic nerve pain in my arms and legs for the last five years, five plus years now, until tonight. And I met a couple in Lubbock, Texas, not where I'm from, but where I retired to, that was from, associated with Bethel, and they prayed for me, and that was the first time I ever experienced real prayer. That's when my breakthrough started was April of 2011. By September of 2011, I came to visit the healing rooms. I was in a lot of pain. I, I just looked at my medicine records a few days ago. I had six or seven sheets of medicine with about 15 to 20 meds per sheet that I've been on in the last uh, five plus years. Long story short, I was seeing breakthrough and it was coming, but it was slow. It didn't happen overnight. Sometimes it would go away and it would come back. So I'm thinking, why do I have to deal with this PTSD? I came here for my nerve pain. God, what is going on? I want this pain out of my body because it's like cutting yourself with razor blades, having acid poured on your skin and your bones crush 24-7. You can't breathe. I couldn't play with my kids. I couldn't be with my wife. I lost my love of music because the, the, the sound and the vibration was so intense. I have to sit at the back of the church or by the exit. I couldn't stand bright lights. So my senses kind of got dulled. All that's gone. And <laughs> so when Mike came and, and prayed for you, did, did, did what happened? Uh, Mike came and prayed for me, and he held on to my wrist, and I started to panic because I did not want to be restrained. I don't think I could take Mike. He's a big guy, but I think I could take him, <laughs> even in my weakened state. But what Mike did for me and what Jesus did through Mike to me was he made me look at his eyes and he wouldn't let me put my head down. And I kept wanting to put my head down because I didn't realize the guilt and the shame I was carrying from the horrific and horrible events that I cannot even put into words nor do I want to because I don't see those images anymore and I don't feel that pain. <laughs> On the 10th of January, I went to my doctor with my wife. You know, I've been about 100 different doctors and specialists for my nerves and the PTSD, and I asked him, 
I said, uh, does PTSD ever go away? You know, can it be cured? Is there medicine? What's the answer? Because, I, I, you know, I'm always thinking about taking my life. I'm always, and everything's intense for me and my family. And they said, no, you don't ever lose PTSD. Well, the devil is a lie, and so is that doctor. <laughs> <clears throat> Amen. 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 So Monday night, I, you know, I got prayer from Mike, and as he was praying for me, I was crying. I was sweating, he, and I kept putting my head down. He said, look in my face. I said, don't tell me what to do. And <laughs> he's like, I'm not letting you go until you look at me. And so he just kind of walked me through the stages, and I can't even tell you what all of them were, but it was a short prayer. It was only five minutes. It wasn't nothing deep, but it was like Jesus was touching my hand, and he was speaking to me, and I felt a peace that I haven't felt since I was probably a young child. And I walked in the door of my house Monday night, and I kind of floated in the house, I guess. <laughs> and my wife said to me, she said, babe, what happened? I said, I'm free. <laughs> I'm free. <laughs> Let's stand and praise the Lord for days and freedom. <laughs> so happy for you. you. And you couldn't have normally got up in front of this many people and stood in the light, could you? Hey, man, you are free. Yeah. Okay. My wife told me, she said, babe, it looks like you've lost 2,000 pounds off your shoulders, and I don't know who you are, because she's only lived with me since I've had this PTSD. She's lived through the nightmare. She's lived through being attacked in my sleep. She's lived in fear. My kids have dealt with it. She's lived through all the medication. But since then, in the last two days, I've played with my kids, I've held them, I've hugged them. I haven't been afraid of what's on TV, what's outside. And even better, when I, before I came here tonight, I just gotta say this, I was still having the pain in my wrist, but I said, God, you've been so good, you've already brought me through, you got me out of bed, you got me out of the wheelchair, you got me off all these medications and narcotics. And tonight, when I go there, it's gonna be done. And I don't need prayer because I'm just going there to glorify what you did for me. As I was sitting in the lobby over there at five minutes to six, I was sitting there waiting for him to open the doors. And all of a sudden, I felt my left hand. And I looked down and I was like, hand? <laughs> You're back. <laughs> and nobody prayed for me. There was no worship going on. I got on the phone and I called my wife and I said, thank you, Jesus. Not only am I at peace, I have no more pain. I can touch my hands, I can clap my hands, I can feel my fingers, I can dance. And the music didn't hurt me, the lights don't hurt me, the devil's alive, Jesus came me. Father God is so great, he brought me home. My Father in heaven, thank you for bringing me home and rescuing me and giving me Yeah, so for years, I've ended that video by saying, you get free of PTSD, you become a preacher. Uh, and then just three years ago during COVID, um, Adrian sent me an email, and all of us in the email was a photograph of licensing for ministry certificate where he was licensed as a police chaplain uh, for ministry. He ministers in his community in Colorado as a police chaplain to both the police as well as to those that have had crimes committed against them. So give thanks to God. Well, isn't that amazing? <clears throat> so there's one thing, um, Mike, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint real quick if we could. Um, I want to walk you through something to talk about unhealed trauma for just a second, uh, unhealed childhood trauma, uh, to give you some symptoms of that so that you understand. Um, when I mentioned the book, um, The Deepest Well, by Nadine Burke Harris, uh, she talks a lot about a test that the Kaiser Permanente, uh, an inventory that the Kaiser Permanente group published called the ACE inventory, which is adverse childhood effects or child, adverse childhood experiences. 
And basically, it's an inventory that you as an adult can take that it basically, depending upon how many adverse childhood experiences you've had in your life, it can determine not only mental health possibility issues, but also physical health issues. And in the book, uh, The Deepest Well, uh, Dr. Harris actually uh, documents that people who have uh, lots of adverse childhood experiences or unhealed childhood trauma, they're, they're, the risk of strokes is four to six times higher. The incidence of heart issues is eight to 10 times higher. Uh, the incidence of diabetes is like doubled compared to other people. So there's all sorts of physical uh, reactions when childhood trauma is present. So just really quick, many times, and, and I, guys, I have to say, I did have a little bit of childhood trauma in my life, but I can still relate, but, but not severe like a lot of people I, I uh, pray with. But I can kind of relate to a lot of these. So uh, just because you can relate to some of these doesn't mean that you have unhealed childhood trauma. But let me be clear about one thing. I Thank you, Holy Spirit. Let's be clear about the culture that we live in right now. Statistics prove that one out of three women will have experienced some kind of sexual abuse or unwanted sexual contact before the age of 12. One out of three. One out of five men will have had the same thing before the age of 14. So sexual trauma, children, is significantly on the rise. Uh, that doesn't even take into account physical abuse, ne abandonment, neglect, things like that. And as we talked about, unhealed childhood trauma can be either trauma A, which is the absence of good things, or trauma B, the presence of bad things, or both. So anyway, it manifests in adults as always needing to fix others, uh, having a very uh, seeking to be a people pleaser in everything that you do. Uh, Co-dependency, where you give responsibility for, uh, you know, what's going on with you to other people, type of a thing, being dependent upon them. Uh, always needing external validation, uh, always seeking that out. Uh, living on high alert, looking for a threat. Uh, fear of abandonment in all relationships, not just, not just parental relationships, but all relationships. Um, deprioritizing your own needs. In other words, you're always seeking to meet other people's needs. You have a need to be needed and kind of denying that you have needs yourself. By the way, let me say this. Jesus said very clearly that the only way we could truly love others is if we could love ourselves. And one of the issues in unhealed childhood trauma is the inability to love you. And as I, as I said last night, one of the ways that I can guarantee that you have unhealed trauma in your life is if you can't look in the mirror and really love that person on the other side of the mirror. If you can't look in their eyes and love them, but you actually have critical, judgmental, or hatred towards yourself. There is the need to always prove yourself. So there, they may be workaholics. They may be perfectionists. Uh, they also have a tendency to attract narcissistic partners. And those who are narcissists actually are kind of on the lookout for uh, those that have been traumatized in the past. And finally, you have difficulty setting boundaries. Uh, you let people basically run all over you and uh, you buy into the lie that, um, that setting boundaries for yourself, healthy boundaries where people can't be just running into your life all the time is, uh, is, is really a tough thing. By the way, one of the best books besides the whole uh, Henry Cloud and Town, John Townsend book on boundaries. One of the best books in talking about boundaries is, is Danny Silk's Keep Your Love On. How many of you have read that book or are familiar with it? Uh, 
he has a, a great illustration in that of the circles of intimacy that you should have. How, you know, in the middle, it's you and Jesus. The next circle is you and your spouse. The third circle beyond that is you and your children and, and kind of going like that. And so many times people with unhealed childhood trauma don't know how to do that. They, they, they just let all sorts of people into their most intimate circles of influence. And uh, obviously, how many of you know Jesus had circles of influence? How many of you know he had three guys? And then he had 12 guys, and then he had another 70. And so if Jesus could do it, we can do it too. Is that right? Amen. Could I get an amen? amen? Okay. Now let's move on ahead with the, with the PowerPoint, Mike. And by the way, give it up from, just keep going till we get to the prayer. Oh, right here. I want to go back one. Thank you. By the way, Mike is doing a phenomenal job with our PowerPoint videos, isn't he? <laughs> Thankful. So in Japanese art culture... I was going to end with this in the last session, but I want to bring this to your attention. In Japanese art culture, there's this process called kintsugi or kintsukuroi. And basically, when a piece of art, a piece of pottery is broken, instead of throwing it away and making a new one, they actually take the piece of pottery, they take the pieces, and they put it back together with either gold or silver lacquer. It is a process of saving the original design of the creator of the piece of art. But at the same time, it becomes more beautiful and more valuable for having been broken. And my friends, next slide if you would. This is what God wants to do with our hearts. Amen. He wants to heal our shattered hearts. And in the midst of it, we actually end up better than we were even before, because not because God intended for us to have shattered hearts, but instead God makes all things new, and he restores even better than it was in the beginning. So next slide, if you would, please. So we're going to walk through this healing prayer model. I'm going to walk you through each step. You have it. You have a handout there that you can take little notes on the side if you want to, but uh, we're just going to walk through this. Then when I'm done taking you through all the understandings of the healing prayer model, um, then we'll take questions. Then I'm going to pray for you corporately, uh, this prayer model, so that you can see how it's demonstrated. And then at the end, we'll do some impartation. So I want to be clear with you about one thing. I want everybody, don't take any notes. I want you to hear what I'm saying. <clears throat> This is a prayer ministry model. It's not a counseling model. Uh, I, 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 once again, I'm all for counselors, but you don't have to be a counselor or a pastor or some kind of mental health professional or an emotional healing professional or an inner healing professional or somebody that engages in this to do this model. Uh, my students at Global School of Supernatural Ministry are trained in two models. They are trained in the five-step healing prayer model, how to bring physical healing to people when they go out in the streets and minister to people in some of the darkest places of Harrisburg, uh, where we live across the river from Harrisburg, uh, the state capital of Pennsylvania. And they're trained in the trauma healing prayer model. So they learn both of these models, and they take it out in the streets, and they see people healed all the time. We have hundreds and hundreds of testimony who people on the streets who have come to Christ, and then they received healing, both physical as well as of their trauma, to get healed. So understand that this is something that anybody can do if you just have a heart to do it. That's ultimately what this is all about. Number two, I want you to understand that while you have a handout and there's a, a, a prayer card that's available, um, you don't have to memorize this entire prayer model. You just, I just want you to get the basics of an understanding of how to pray for people. And then will you trust Holy Spirit that as you pray for people, the Holy Spirit will lead you about what steps to follow as you follow this. Okay, now obviously, if you're in a prayer room, if you're in a, a healing prayer room like the Silicon Valley prayer room, if you're in a counselor's office, you'll have your handout or your card there and you can walk people through that. Uh, that's available. But for anybody that's just 
normal, everyday, out on the streets, uh, seeking to be a blessing and be uh, a disciple of Jesus. Uh, you can do this, and you can do it with the Holy Spirit's help if you'll trust Him in it. So anyway, here we go. We're going to walk through it. Next slide, if you would, please. So this is the eight steps that we're going to walk through and give an understanding of what each step means. So next slide, if you would, please. So the first one is ask an interview. Uh, you're going to interview the person. If somebody comes to you and say, man, I've got a lot of issues with maybe my physical health or I have issues with sleeping or I have issues with trauma, you want to, you want to ask specifically what experience or action caused the trauma and resulted in the symptoms of PTSD or unhealed trauma. Now, I want to be clear that when we are talking with somebody who has multiple traumas, the number one thing we want to get to is what is the most significant trauma that still haunts you. I use the term, what is the trauma that still haunts you, that still comes back to you over and over again? Um, I... You know, when you are dealing with somebody who's had a whole history of life of traumas, they will have a tendency to want to take you through every trauma that they've been through and every gory detail that they've, they've had about that trauma. And guys, unless you're in a counseling situation, I would recommend that you stop with the most significant trauma. Why do I say that? Well, simply because you can either be in that situation for over an hour listening to all the trauma, or you can get to the heart of the matter and pray for just all of the traumas that are in that person, but you don't need to know every single one. I, I used to, as I've trained people in this prayer model, I would say, you know, try your best to just get what the main trauma is and then go into prayer. And they say, well, what if they keep talking and, and, and how do I stop them if they go on for 10 minutes? And I'll say, well, um, the best uh, way to stop them is when they breathe. Because <laughs> when anybody's talking, eventually they have to take a breath. Now, I know for some folks that may be a while, but when they breathe... <laughs> You can smile at them. By the way, this is a friendly. This is a this is a friendly ministry situation where we're going to be giving them the love of Jesus. So we want to do a lot of smiling at them, and let them know that it's okay. And so when they take a breath, I'll smile at them and I'll say, "Thank you, Chris." Right? Yes. Thank you, Chris. That's all I need to know. And then if they keep going, wait till they breathe the next time and say, "Thank you." That's all I need to know. But I, I, this worked for years. It worked well with really great. And then we did an Unbroken conference every year uh, in December at Global Awakening in Mechanicsburg. We do an Unbroken conference where we deal with the issues of emotional healing, of trauma and deliverance. And Katie Luce, who is over Connect Up Ministries, and Rodney Hoag, uh, who is the guy, our go-to guy for deliverance comes, and we teach on that. So at one of these, I'd done a session on trauma, and this lady came up, and she, she had a piece of paper in her hand. And I said, hi, how, you know, how can I assist you? I, guys, whenever I have people come up to me for prayer, I never say, how can I pray for you? I always say, how can I assist you? Uh, because I think it's presumptuous that everybody that comes to me is going to ask for prayer. So she says, well, I've got all this trauma in my life, and I need, I'm going to tell you about every one of them. And so what I came to discover, that most of the trauma had to do with all the really bad choices she made in men. And literally, she had a front and back list of all the men and all the trauma that she'd been through with them. And I'd, I'd do that. I'd smile at her and say, thank you. That's all I need to know. She goes, no, no, I need to tell you this. And so she'd tell me another thing. And I'd say, and by the way, I've got 10 other people lined up behind her. This is in the old days when I was literally praying for, for everybody. And, uh, and once again, and about two or three times, and I finally stopped her and I said, ma'am, if you don't let me pray for you, because by the way, how many of you know it was the same trauma over and over and over again, except with different men? Yeah. 
that you understand what I'm talking about here. And quite frankly, let me say to you, while there is such a thing as CPTSD, where there are different traumas with most people, it's basically the same experience of trauma, just in different settings. How many of you understand what I just said? So she got angry at me. She says, no, I have to tell you about every one of these. And I said, then I'm not going to get to pray for you. And I said, you, if you want me to pray for you, I will. But I, I can't, this is not a counseling session. This is a prayer ministry session. And I, I believe that many of you are, are going to find yourselves put into situations where you're going to be praying individually for a number of people. And you're going to be on the streets where you're going to be praying for people. And you only have a few minutes to pray for folks. And I'll tell you, if you'll be faithful to, to do this, God will give you the ability to do it and still love on the people in a wonderful way. So I'm going to ask an interview. If, if I find out that they served in the military in any way, shape, or form, I'm going to thank them for their service and their sacrifice. And here's what I say to them. This is something God gave to me. You don't have to do it. But I will say, thank you for your service. Thank you for laying down your life for our freedom. Your, free, your, your service has not been in vain because we are still free. And I like to say that to everyone that I minister to. And in particular, when I'm dealing with Vietnam veterans, uh, I like to add one more thing. I like to say to them, welcome home. Because most of Vietnam veterans uh, never were welcomed home. But instead, when they came through the gateway of San Francisco Airport, they were actually persecuted and shamed and called horrible names and really driven out of our society. So it's important that we honor those veterans. And whether you've served in war as a, as a military person or however you've served at all, and you're a veteran of our United States military, would you just stand real quick? Would you just do that? I don't want to expose anybody. Would you just give thanks and honor these amazing men and women? Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's stand up for them. Yay! Yeah. Welcome home to all of you. Thank you. Because giving them honor is so critical. Uh, because dishonor creates trauma. So that's the ask and interview. Step two. Next slide, please. I'm going to tell the person I'm going to be praying for them. And this is a very important point. I'm going to ask their permission to pray for them. Now, why is that an important piece? Well, we believe whether it's about emotional healing, physical healing, or deliverance, that we actually want to empower the person that we're praying for to not only receive their healing, but to be part of that process. So we don't operate at Global Awakening or in my ministry as God. God's man or woman of power for the hour. Let me say this again. We don't operate like we are God's men or women of power for the hour. We believe in empowering the people that we're praying for to step into the healing process themselves. But in order to do that, I need to ask their permission for them to say yes to be praying for them. That I don't ever assume that they fully get how I'm going to be praying for them. Because, guys, how many of you know, in much of, of our culture and even in much of the church, most people don't have a concept of one-on-one -on -one prayer. When, when I say I'm going to pray for you, even if they're Christians, they think, oh, you're going to put me on your prayer list. Right? You're going to put me on your church's prayer list. Well, how many of you know Jesus never had a prayer list? If he said he's going to pray for you, you're going to get prayer right then from him. Amen. And then we believe that's the model of Jesus. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm going to ask them to keep eye contact with me the entire time I'm praying for them. Now, many people ask, well, why is this necessary? Well, the Holy, because I asked the Holy Spirit the same thing when he told me to do this. And he gave me three reasons. Number one, when 
when I'm praying for them, because the love of Christ is within me, the word says that the eyes are the windows of the soul, that the eyes are the, the lamp. And they're going to experience the love of God through looking into my eyes. Not my love, but his love. And that's going to help them during the times that things get the most intense. Number two, many people who have severe trauma do something that is in a natural skill of the human brain called dissociation. Now, dissociation is when things get intense or you do things without thinking of them or as in the case of children who have been severely traumatized, they go to another place, another reality in their brain so that they're not present as you're praying for them. So let me explain dissociation for the normal everyday person. If you have ever driven back and forth to go to work to the same place, how many of you have done that in the, in the past, right? How many of you that you put your keys in the car and you turn on the car and the next thing you know you're at your job? Anybody ever done that? <laughs> well, you just dissociated. That is, you were able to drive, but your mind was somewhere else. So, you know, I mean, I thank God for angels and all this stuff, but that's, that's what happens. Well, when you begin to pray for people with trauma, they don't want to stay in the present in this present reality because they're afraid that it's going to be too painful again. Now, I want to I, I wanna break um, a paradigm that we have about going deeper into our souls about trauma. Many people talk about the layers that we all have, that we feel like we're going into deeper and deeper and deeper layers. This is my Cutchings opinion, but I honestly believe that God did not make us to be onions or vegetables. I believe that what the Holy Spirit, the process that the Holy Spirit uses is that at appropriate times, he begins to take his finger. Jesus called the Holy Spirit the finger of God. And he begins to put his finger on places that he once healed. And he'll keep his finger on that place until you give him permission to heal that. The, the concept of the layers, taking off the layers, breeds the belief that there's something so painful down there that we don't want to go there which is why everybody has a tendency to stay on the surface with trauma. They don't want to go to the very deep root of the most painful trauma because they believe it's going to be too painful, which is why many times when you start going after that in prayer, people begin to dissociate. And, it, the, and once again, we're talking about eye contact. How it looks is their eyes glaze over, and when you're looking at them, it looks like, the old phrase, the lights are on, but nobody's home. It's also called by the military, the thousand yard stare, where you, you have people who literally are staring. And it's like they're looking right through you. They're really not looking at anything. So that's dissociation. And when that happens, when I see their eyes glaze over, I just welcome them to come back into the reality that's happening right now, that prayer session, because the other reality is only going to prolong the, 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 the misery of their trauma. So that's the second reason for eye contact. The third reason is many times demonic influence can show up in people's eyes. Uh, when you're looking them in the eye, the pupils can move back and forth pretty rapidly, or the whites of their eyes can change color into green or black or red, things like that. And guys, there's no reason to panic or be upset. As a matter of fact, it's, it's a pretty happy moment for me because that means they've come out of their cover of darkness that they've hidden under trauma, and now they're being exposed and revealed. And that's exciting because their influence is on the way to being broken off of this people's life in Jesus' name. Now, let me say this. We'll talk about this again when we go after uh, the powers of darkness. But guys, 
You don't have to shout at people to get the devils out of them. As a matter of fact, let's be clear. Let's just be clear. I don't see Jesus shouting at anybody. As a matter of fact, demons don't respond to the volume of your voice. They respond to the authority that you walk in. And if you walk under the authority of Jesus, you can very calmly and very quietly say, in the name of Jesus, you demonic spirit of trauma, come out of them. We break the assignment that you have off of their life in Jesus' name and leave now. We close the door of access to you in Jesus' name. And we can do that very quietly. We don't have to scream or shout. People don't have to throw up. People don't have to spit or burp or fart or anything. They can just, I mean, I'm just saying to you, I'm not saying it won't happen, but what I am saying is it, uh, this is one thing I learned. Rodney Hogue has told me this over and over again. Rodney has an amazing book. How many of you know Rodney Hogue? Anybody? Rodney has an amazing book called Liberated. His book on forgiveness is the absolute classic in forgiveness. But Rodney says this, well, if you bring out the buckets and the, and the trash cans, then they will throw up. But if you just decide you're not going to let that happen because of the authority of Jesus Christ, and we're going to go for the authority of Jesus Christ and not a physical reaction, that's, that works even better. How many of you agree with that statement? Anybody? Okay, that's good. I'm glad. At least that's the way we're going to handle it. So anyway, explain that I'm going to be praying for different parts of the soul, the mind, and the body for healing and restoration. Now step three, next slide please is I'm going to look them in the eye and I'm going to declare the forgiveness of God in Jesus' name. Now, let me say this. In these bullet points, I don't have specifically the prayer to pray, okay? If you go to the back of my book in the appendix, the entire prayer is completely written out. And I know a number of you have come to me and said, you've read through those prayers over and over again, and you've seen how many of experienced healing just by reading those prayers in your book. I know we have a couple that have said that to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare the forgiveness of God to them by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And last night I did this as I prayed for you guys and I said, in the name of Jesus, you are completely forgiven of all of your sin. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed you from all your sin. So there's nothing between you and God. <clears throat> now, that's significant because many people have believed the lie that God is punishing them for sins that he still holds against them. But if you have received the work of Christ into your life, God is holding nothing against you. There is no separation between you and the Father. God is not in the punishing business with you. I'll say it one more time. God is not in the punishing business with you. <clears throat> that's significant because the next part is just as significant in that we're going to ask them next to ask the Holy Spirit if there's anybody that hurt them or wounded them or caused them trauma that they need to forgive. And how we're going to do that is we're going to say, we're going to invite you to close your eyes and ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, is there anybody that I need to forgive? And when he brings up a face or a name, you just have them, and they can do this in, quiet. They don't have to say it out loud. Say, Father, I forgive them. You forgive them. I release them. Father, I forgive them. You forgive them. I release them. Because Jesus said in John, in Matthew chapter 6, in the prayer that he gave his disciples to pray, that literally we're releasing people from the debt that we believe they owe us because of what they did to us. When you walk in unforgiveness, basically what you are carrying is a, an attitude of revenge and that you want a debt paid back to you for what happened to you. And as Jesus said, as you have been forgiven your sins, so forgive the sins of others. Now, this is a very important, important part of this process because remember we said in Isaiah 61 that Jesus came to set the captives free. 
So when you think of captives, you think of chains. And we love songs like Break Every Chain and The Chains Are Broken and all this other stuff. Well, the chain that keeps you connected to the trauma that the people did to you is the unforgiveness that you have against them. I'm going to say it again just so we're clear. That the chain that keeps you connected to all of the trauma that these people that hurt you did to you, the chain that keeps you connected is the unforgiveness and the insistence on some kind of debt being paid for what happened to you. So the way we break the chain is we receive the grace of God to forgive them as we have been forgiven. And so that's why we're able to say, Father, I forgive them, you forgive them, I release them. So when I was in Rwanda in August, <clears throat> what I kept hearing was that th since the genocide, you know, nobody came and helped them during the genocide. But since the genocide, all of these outside experts were coming into Rwanda and telling the Rwandan people what to do. And one of the big things they kept telling them to do is, you must forgive, you must forgive, you must forgive. I mean, psychological professionals and social workers and preachers and everybody was coming. But what occurred to me was, is that there are some traumas that are so horrific that I actually don't have the strength of will to be able to forgive. And you need to understand that you're going to be dealing with people like that. I mean, when you deal with boys and girls and men and women who have been human trafficked so much that they were being sexually assaulted 30 to 50 times a day for years on end, when you deal with, you know, people who've been so horribly ritually abused that the very people that they were supposed to trust with were using them in their satanic ritual, uh, uh, you know, services. Um, I mean, th that's just horrific stuff. And so to bring them to a place that you have to say, by an act of your will, you must forgive them. That's what I was dealing with when I was with, Ru with Rwanda, with the Rwandan people. And um, I, I brought a message about how when we don't have it within us to forgive, we can call upon the same grace, the power that Christ forgave us, we can call upon that grace to be the power that helps us forgive others. So when we don't have it, Christ has it for us. He will give us everything we need to say, Father, I forgive them. You forgive them. I release them. Because you see, if watch this. If you forgive people in your own strength, it's your thing. But when you forgive people counting on the grace that forgave you, the divine empowering presence of God, it's now God's thing through you. And you can be completely released by giving complete forgiveness in Jesus' name. How many of you understood what I just said? So in the midst of that, I'm going to, I, if they're having difficulty forgiving, I'm going to say, well, have you been forgiven yourself? And if they say yes, I say, well, that same grace that forgave you is available for you to forgive others. Call upon it now. And every time we'll see success in that. Now, many people ask, well, what do you do if you're ministering to somebody and they aren't Christians? Well, guys, this is a perfect time to welcome them into the kingdom, to let them know that the only, the only person that can bring healing to their trauma is the one who loved them enough to die for them. Now, here's the other side of that coin. If they're not willing to receive the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for their sin, then I can't really walk through the rest of the prayer with them. Because the rest of the prayer is based upon their response of faith to the work of Christ on the cross. They must respond to that. And you may say, well, that's kind of mean. Well, I'm just telling you, I, the only medicine I know is the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. 
That's the only medicine I know that heals trauma. And no amount of any special prayer from me or any kind of formula or magic thing we say over each other is going to bring healing to trauma. It's only the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. So if they're not willing to, to go there, then I'm just going to bless them, maybe pray for a physical healing or something like that and pray that God would bless them in some other way. But I'm not going to walk through the rest of the prayer with them. Okay? Step four. Um, I'm going to, I, I love to memorize Isaiah 61 because it's kind of the, the bones of this whole process. And in terms of walking through setting captives free and healing the brokenhearted and those things. But in this step that can be brought into actually step three if you want to, I want to look these people, everybody look at me in the eye real quick. Just look at me. I want to look at them and I say, in the name of Jesus, you carry no shame any longer in the name of Jesus from your trauma. There's nothing about you that has any shame. There's nothing in you that has any shame in Jesus' name. And I have learned, Stephanie, I'm sure you've learned this, that when you look somebody in the eye and say to them, you have nothing to be ashamed of, that is a powerful declaration because it like it breaks something off of them. And it's this, you know, the heaviness that we that it talks about in Isaiah 61, verse 3, when it talks about the, man, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I believe that's shame. I believe that's shame. And shame is attached to your identity. Shame says there's something bad about you. That's why these bad things have happened to you. So shame is about identity, who I really am. Secondly, I'm going to declare to them again, you have nothing to be guilty of. Because guilt, if I have something to be guilty of, then I'm open to have trauma in my life because I believe somehow that God is punishing me for all the bad that I've done. Shame says there's something bad about you. Guilt, false guilt says you've done something bad, which is why you've been punished. And in Jesus' name, we break both of those things off of them. And then the last thing is condemnation. You know, the Word of God says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. To, be, to feel condemned means that you're hopeless and there's nothing for you to do about that. But in Jesus we don't have any condemnation. Instead, we're full of hope and faith, believing for greater things ahead. Could I have an agreement in the room? Amen? Amen. Next slide, please. Step five is where we go after the assignments of the powers of darkness. Now watch this. While you're praying for this person, even though you've prepared ahead of time, they've still got some things talking to them. They got spirit of trauma, spirit of fear, spirit of torment, sometimes spirit of suicide, They're, which is why it's important that they may, uh, they may maintain eye contact with me the whole time so I keep their attention on what God is doing in our time together rather than paying attention to those voices. And it's at this time that we literally, we, we cancel the assignment that the powers of darkness have had against them. Now, I'll explain this again so that we're really clear. How the powers of darkness get access to people through trauma is a traumatic event happens. And when that traumatic event happens, the spirit of trauma will come and use that event as a landing strip. And we begin to assign meaning to the trauma that is not true. For instance, this traumatic event happened to you because you're a bad person. Or this traumatic event happened to you because God's punishing you. Or, or, or this type of a thing. And so not only are there now traumatic images and memories, but now there are also lies associated with them that have made us believe things about ourselves and about our reality that the spirit of trauma wants us to believe.
It also sets up a spirit of fear that is the root of panic and anxiety where we begin to live under a spirit of fear that this thing has happened once and it could probably happen again to me. And so we walk in a spirit of fear that actually continues to bring an open door of access to lying to us about our trauma. Now, you'll notice that I don't give you a big list of different demons or powers of darkness to cancel their assignment because I want you to be led by the Holy Spirit to, to, to know how, how to pray against these things. But we're, we're bringing the blood of Jesus Christ against trauma, against fear, against torment, against anything connected to anxiety or rage, against suicide, and even the spirit of death. Let me say this to you. When you're praying for somebody and the Lord says, go after a spirit of death, it's probably the absolute real thing because there's many people who've been severely traumatized that are tormented during their nights by a dark thing that comes into their room and terrorizes them on a regular basis. And it's like the monsters that you had when you were a little kid, but you had no idea where they came from. And you were told that they were imaginary. Well, for folks who are severely traumatized, the dark thing that's the spirit of death that's come to terrorize them is really there to torment them and terrorize them and make them always feel like that, that they have a hopeless future and they're just about ready to die. So we break the power of the spirit of death because if they're a believer, the same spirit that raised Jesus' dead body from the grave lives in them. Therefore, we don't have to fear death in any way, shape, or form in Jesus' name. Is that true? Amen. So that, these are the things that we do. We just continue to cut off and sever the assignments of the powers of darkness, commanding all afflicting and tormenting influence to leave and never return in Jesus' name. Now, many people, because they have severe pain in their bodies, may have an afflicting spirit. An afflicting spirit is a spirit of pain that when you begin to pray against the pain, the pain will either increase, that is, it'll get worse, or it'll move around to different parts of the body. When the pain begins to move, you know you've got a spirit. And that's exciting because if it's moving, it means it's on its way out. Now, what you may need to do is tell that spirit exactly how to go out of the body. So if it's in the leg, we commend it to go out of the feet. If it's in the arms, to go out of the hands, to go out of the shoulder, wherever it is. But I can tell you that there was one lady that I was at Bethel, I was praying for her, and she had severe pain in her shoulder. And this is before I really knew how to go after afflicting spirits in a very quick way. Uh, I began to pray for that pain in her shoulder, and it moved to her chest. And I, and I said, okay, in Jesus' name, we command the pain in the chest to leave and never return and be healed. And then it moved to her stomach, and then it moved to her hip, and then it moved to her leg. And finally, I realized, I said, ma'am, let me ask you a question. Do you have any occult influence in your life? And she said, oh, yeah, I used to do seances all the time. And I was like, oh, okay, now that makes sense. <laughs> so we got her to repent of the occult and witchcraft, and, and we commended the thing to leave her out, out of the foot. And, I mean, she was in immense pain in her hip. I mean, the pain had exacerbated to like a 15 type of a thing. And once she repented and received forgiveness, I told her to command the thing to go, and it left immediately, and it never returned. She got completely healed. So you will deal with afflicting spirits every once in a while when you're dealing with people that uh, have a lot of trauma. Next step, number six, please. <clears throat> now... Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go here real quick. Um, before I do the first part, let me talk about the second part. If the person has experienced any kind of sexual assault or violation, sever every soul tie that was created and connects the person to the abuser. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says, as he's talking about being the, that we are temples of the Holy Spirit, 
He is rebuking the Corinthians because they lived in a culture where their natural worship was to go to a temple. And as part of worshiping the God of that temple, that you would have sexual, sexual relations with either male or female prostitutes. And he was telling them that any person that you have sexual contact with actually sets up a one flesh union between you and that other person. It, what we call a soul tie. And if you have been sexually violated or abused by any person where there's been some kind of sexual exchange took place, then you are connected to that person or people that abused you. And in order to be free from that trauma, you have got to sever that by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. We have a video, video number six. And in video number six is a student that came to our global summer intensive. Her name is Sue Kutz, and uh, she has a testimony of how God brought healing to her, to, to her through the disconnecting of soul ties. So if we could show video number six, Sue, that would be great. Hi, my name is Sue Kutz. I'm from State College. Hi, my name is Sue Kutz. I'm from State College, Pennsylvania and currently here at the GSI school at Global Awakening. And I went through the PTSD training um, a day or so ago. And so I just wanted to quickly give you an idea of what it happened and what it uh, did for me. I had had a whole life of abuse, abuse from my father and a lot of abuse from my husband as well. And uh, very, very traumatic things ever since I was a child. So I have had night terrors my whole life, which is 50 plus years, um, and have not been able to sleep a whole night through in well over 30, almost 40 years now. So exhaustion was a regular part of my life, and night terrors continued even after my husband died. Uh, my husband chose to commit suicide, and that, of course, was equally traumatic. So even though a lot of, uh, I think, this kind of training and therapy um, have helped people um, who have been in the armed forces and done things, and I think they're doing miraculous things with that, a lot of people are still suffering um, from everyday kind of life traumas. So. Um, we went through the training and I realized that something still was bothering me, even with, you know, intensive therapy for several years. Uh, I just couldn't break free from that and I still couldn't sleep. But what I figured out was a portion of this um, cuts off soul ties and that after we walk through all of those pieces and um, basically cut the soul ties that were still attached to me from my husband and my father. Um, that night, I slept the whole night for the first time, and it was absolutely sweet bliss. And um, my short-term short memory came back the next morning, which was like really a surprise and kind of an added bonus, but I don't feel like I'm going crazy anymore. And when I get up out of bed, I'm like, Oh my God, I'm not tired. I'm really not tired. But what I realized was um, I finally had freedom. Um, even though the Lord had really filled my heart and I had a lot of faith and a lot of hope and had learned to manage things, I wasn't free or healed of it. And this was just utterly miraculous. It did heal me, but it's a freedom that is so blessed, I just stand in utter awe. Like literally, you could walk through this in a couple of minutes, and it did more for me than years and years and years of therapy to try to learn to deal with it. Don't deal with it. Don't live with it. There is a really wonderful option, and it's really just going through this training and trusting that the Lord does not want you to live this way, and you can have this freedom. Take it. I really wish you the best. Thank you. Here's a fun story about Sue. So Sue, after she got healed, 
she, uh, she's from Pennsylvania, and she went to a church because they had heard about her testimony. She'd given her testimony at home church. So she went to this, goes to this other church, and this other church just happens to have a church that they planted in Brazil that they share live streaming with. Since she was a special speaker, they live streamed Sue's message and testimony to the church in Brazil. Well, there were so many women that got healed in the church in Brazil that they were going to do a women's conference in two months. So they invited Sue to come down and give her testimony, which now had a message at the women's conference. There were over a thousand women at that conference, and Sue's message and ministry was the highlight of the entire conference. Since then, now it's not done. Watch this. Since then... She goes six to seven times a year to Brazil to speak in women's conferences. She has moved from being this kind of retired person who just retired out of, a, out of an administrative position to now she's had to move to Dallas-Fort Worth from Pennsylvania because she lives close to the airport because she's flying anywhere from 10 to 12 times a year to Brazil to do women's conferences and speak in churches. She's turned into an itinerant minister who brings healing to trauma to the women in Brazil. Come on, somebody praise God. Isn't that incredible? And she, she wrote a book that I endorsed called Jesus Shattered My Religion. <laughs> yeah, if you look it up on Amazon, it's there. So its name is Sue Kutz. But anyway, this step, step six, is important because it's at this place that we ask the person to take their right hand and put their right hand on their chest. And then we begin to pray, Holy Spirit, come and bring healing to their soul. Heal their mind their will, and their emotions in Jesus' name. And, put, and, and we literally use the phrase, put the pieces back together so that they experience wholeness in Jesus' name. Now, the term shalom, as used in the Hebrew, is not just the word for peace, but is actually the word for wholeness, that you would experience wholeness. So as they have their hand on their chest and we're praying for their soul, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to bring shalom to their soul, to stop the chaos, to stop the chaos of trauma and bring shalom and wholeness to them in the name of Jesus. The next step then is to take that same right hand and put it on the right back side of their head, which as we talk, this is where all the traumatic images and memories are. And we let them put their hand on their head uh, unless they ask us to. Uh, but we just have them put their hand right here. And then we speak healing to the traumatic images and memories and commend them to dry up and die in Jesus' name. Now, a lot of people ask me, why do you use the phrase dry up and die when it comes to these traumatic images and memories? Because as I was trying to develop this model as led by the Holy Spirit, he led me to Mark chapter 11. And in Mark chapter 11, Jesus and the disciples are, are walking someplace, and they go by this fig tree that is in season. It's got leaves, but it has no fruit. And Jesus curses the fig tree, and the next day they're walking back, and the fig tree is dead. Well, Dr. Carolyn Leaf says that neural pathways in our brain look like little trees. So the Lord just spoke to me about commanding all of the little trees in our brains and neural pathways that contain these traumatic images and memories to dry up and die in Jesus' name. Next slide. Oh, okay, there were that. So according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, Paul writes, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, through the pulling down of strongholds, through the casting down of speculations and imaginations, and every lofty thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of God, and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So what we're what we're doing literally is we're destroying the strongholds of the traumatic images and memories and we're freeing the mind up so the mind is no longer chained to those traumatic images and memories anymore.
then we are severing, and I literally use the word sever, I sever the five senses, the seeing, the smelling, the tasting, and the touching, and the hearing from being triggers to those traumatic images and memories. And that sets them free so that they're no longer being afraid. One of the reasons why people isolate themselves when they carry severe trauma is that they don't want to be triggered by anything that they would see, smell, taste, touch, or feel when they go outside. This ends that process and sets their senses free from that in Jesus' name. Then the other thing that we will do, if they experience chronic nerve pain that's been caused by the trauma, we speak to every part of the body that has inflammation, and we command for all the inflammation to leave in Jesus' name. Now go to the next slide, if you would. Step seven actually takes us through praying for the different systems of the body that have been impacted by trauma and commanding trauma to release out of their muscle memory. So for instance, how many of you know that when you have severe trauma, your entire endocrine system, that is your glands, your thyroid, your parathyroid, your pituitary, your, your adrenal glands are all messed up. Your, your body is not in balance. So we pray healing for the endocrine system. If, if you have if you've been injured during a traumatic event, you speak to the muscle memory in your body and you command the muscle memory in the body to release the trauma of that pain in Jesus' name. If you have been sexually abused or violated by anybody, you command both your reproductive organs as well as the, the genitalia to be completely freed from the trauma of that sexual abuse in Jesus' name. What you're doing is that you are declaring freedom to the different systems of the body that have been afflicted by the trauma and then ask Holy Spirit to reconnect in the brain any connections that have been disconnected through trauma. Trauma experts and neuroscience experts will tell you that one of the things that severe trauma does to the brain is it disconnects the right and left lobe of the brain so that you have difficulty functioning with a balanced mind. Now, God didn't make you a right brain person. He didn't make you a left brain person. He made you a whole brain person. And he wants your whole brain to operate and quit giving excuses because saying, well, I'm a left brainer, I'm a right brainer. Baloney, be a whole brainer in Jesus' name. Just saying. Step eight, I'm going to declare to their person that their identity is in Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that says, if any person be in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has passed away. All things have become new. And then one of the last things I'm going to do before I walk them through their new identity is I'm going to pray over their brains, Proverbs 3, 24. Proverbs 3, 24 says this. Because you walk in covenant with God, you shall no longer lie down in fear, but it is your father's inheritance to you to give you sweet sleep. So for me, sweet sleep is six to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep every night. Now, if you have a bad prostate, I don't, we need to pray for your prostate. <laughs> but besides that, you should be able to, to sleep six to eight hours of uninterrupted sleep with no nightmares, no night terrors, but just the shalom of God over you in the name of Jesus. Now, let me talk with you about praying for children first, and then I'm going to talk with you about praying for people with dissociative identity disorder or multiple personality disorder. So first of all, with children, one of the things you know that under the age of 12, 11 or 12, most children are not developmentally stable enough to be able to actually deal with the concepts of trauma, of post-traumatic stress or anything like that. However, uh, I, whether you have adopted children, whether you have fostered children, or whether you've had your own children that have dealt with trauma in their lives, it can it can manifest itself in many of the same ways 
that it manifests in adults' life, except some of the primary factors are behavioral issues, our attitude issues, our attentional issues in terms of attention deficit or hyperactivity disorder. It can also manifest itself as nightmares and night terrors and an increasing growing feeling of fear and terror that the child carries. <clears throat> because it's difficult for children to actually put into words what happened to them, and as a matter of fact, most trauma experts will tell you that most of us can't accurately put into words what happened when we were traumatized because our brains don't have it rightly processed. So what we recommend and we've seen happen with hundreds and hundreds of children is we have the parents go in and as the children are sleeping, we have them pray the trauma prayer over them. Now, obviously, you don't want to do eye contact because if the child's sleeping. But what we found out is that even though their mind seems to be at rest, their spirit is still active. And as you pray for them, you, you just pray these healing prayers over them. And we see not only nightmares and night terrors and erratic sleep disappear, but we also see behavior and attitudes change significantly. And we even see healing of attentional disorders, uh, uh, process, learning process disorders, and other things like dyslexia completely healed in children. But And then what we do is once that begins to happen, we can begin to have a conversation with our children about how Jesus is healing their heart and healing the, the hurt that's in their heart. And the way that we like to talk with children about it is we try to process with them about the bad things that have happened to them and how Jesus has the power to take those away so they no longer have to be bothered by them any longer. This is the kind of words that we use with kids when we minister to them about that. But we find that the most effective use of this prayer is when the children are sleeping. Now, obviously, if they're 12 years and above, they can deal with this kind of a prayer model. And I, we've seen that happen as well. Just as we see it, adults being healed, we see uh, teenagers and uh, the, the tweeners, what I call them, uh, get healed as well through uh, the power of healing prayer. So that's in, in a very short space, that's what we recommend that you do with children, is that you pray over them as they sleep and see the Lord just move through them as because you as a parent have authority to declare the purposes of God over your child and see them healed. Whether you've been, they've been adopted, whether they've been fostered, uh, you can break the power of any generational things or any kind of abuse that happened to them and see them set free. Now, let me talk about a dissociative identity disorder for just a minute, uh, multiple personality disorder. Uh, and this would even apply to uh, people who talk about satanic ritual abuse or are survivors of that. <clears throat> There are many ministries that do a really wonderful and effective job in ministering to these folks. But I'm saying to you that you cannot minister to them if the first thing you do is go after deliverance. Because it's the same process that happens in dealing with anybody with trauma. You can't cast out wounds of the soul that have happened to this person. And most people who have a problem with alters or dissociative identity disorder have them because of what happened to them as children. Yeah. So we always go after the trauma first and seek to get them healed of the trauma. Now, I know many ministries, particularly when you're dealing with satanic ritual abuse, will, they have lots of models about how to break the curses and all that other stuff. And guys, let me say this to you. Uh, I've not really entered into all of that uh, in, my prayer, in my models of prayer. Uh, there are other ministries that do that. There's a ministry out of New Zealand, Jubilee Resources, that has some great uh, materials that you can look at. It's called Jubilee Resources International out of New Zealand. They have lots of prayers and declarations you can walk through with people. But 
one of the things that I want you to be clear on is that when you are ministering to somebody like this, they can get you in a really confused state where you don't know what to go after first. And I want to say to you, always go after the trauma first. Bring healing to their soul. And if you have to do, if they have some altars that need to be healed as well, you can go after that as well in them if that's what the Holy Spirit leads you to. But please, number one, don't get overwhelmed by the fact that they're talking about how they have multiple personalities or they have different parts of their being. Number two, don't get overwhelmed when people who've had severe evil happen to them try to overwhelm you with all the evil that's happened to them. You don't have to know all that stuff. All you need to know is that the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit is effective to bring healing. And, and, and our experience has been, I'll take questions in just a minute. Our experience has been, and this is not just through my ministry, but for those who've gone after this in very specific ways, is that first of all, it's amazing how many people begin to integrate, that is, their altars begin to come together once the trauma has been dealt with. And many times it's just a matter of making sure that each part of their personalities are, have received some kind of healing, and then people come back to one voice again. Now, I understand I'm being very general and very broad about this. And those of you that have more experience, maybe actually give me some information later on, not in this session. But I want you to understand that the, our main, our number one thing, because this prayer model is only one key on your key ring, okay? It's only one tool, and there are many tools to use to bring healing to people. But this is the breakthrough prayer that will bring healing to the trauma and then set them up for their souls to come back together and to be integrated as one. So that's, I guess, the two comments that I would make about that. And I'm just going to say this as we go into our question time before I pray for you. Please don't ask me any more questions about that here because I don't have a lot more information except for that to give to you. So anyway, Greg, do we have a microphone? If you have a question about anything about the prayer model, I want you to stand and we'll, ask, we'll answer that question and then we'll go from there. Here we go. All the way over there. Hi there. Hi. I, I've heard more than once today this mention. Can you please give me clarity? What are night terrors? I've heard that for a while, but I don't know what that is. Okay. So a night terror is when somebody wakes up in the middle of the night from some horrific dream, and they wake up and they feel like they're in the midst of a panic attack, or they have difficulty catching their breath. And it's like, ah, ah, you know, that, that type of a thing, which is very common among children. But I'm telling you, I've had them as an adult. Any adult want to admit to having night terrors? Yeah. yeah, I've had them. I mean, I've had some that I wondered if I was going to make it through it. I mean, to be honest with you. So that's what it is. And, you know, let me say this about night terrors. If you assign every nightmare and night terror that you've had to demons, then you won't understand the whole process of how the mind deals with things. And many times our dreams and our nightmares are our, our, our soul working out for the things that we're dealing with. And certainly that's been true for me, is that my night terrors have come because I've been in a season of high stress and I feel like I'm out of control. And that, that kind of becomes part of that. So great question. Yes, ma'am. When you're praying for someone and you notice them dissociating and you see it in their eyes, how do you, like, what do you say to welcome them back to be So present? I say, I smile at them and I say, uh, John, come back. Come back. It's safe here. It's safe here. Jesus is here. And I want you to be here where Jesus is and not in your safe place. This is a safe place for you to come to. And that's, that's what I tell them. Yep. Wow. Great question. Okay. Yes. Um, for children that are adults, uh, unlike the younger ones, you can go to the bedroom and pray for them overnight. But for, well, for a young adult, how do young, you advise to pray? For anybody you know, over the age of 12, take them through this prayer model. 
Yeah, what if they will resist? Because I'm trying to get them to the point where they will be receptive because well, right now they're in denial so, of what so the they're way, dealing with. So this is true for any adult. It's a great question. This is true for any adult. If they're not receptive to receiving prayer, you can at least have a conversation about how you went to a seminar and you heard a guy teach on how God heals trauma and post-traumatic stress. And you can tell them about the testimonies that you heard. Now, you never want to say, and you need this too. You just want to tell them and have a conversation. And it is not about them saying, oh gosh, I know I need prayer now. Because if I know adult children, the last thing they want to do is admit to their parents that they need help. But I'm saying to you, if you begin the conversation with them, and you know, if you have one of my books laying around or something like that, uh, you can, I'm not trying to sell books, but I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, you can tell them that's a great resource, but do it in a conversational style and not in trying to put something on them. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. For coaches, counselors, therapists of an online practice, is this still as effective doing like over Zoom? Oh, oh yes, absolutely. Yes. It does huge on Zoom. I have... One of my interns started an entire ministry where he and his team do Zoom prayer ministry over Zoom. They literally do it all over the world. As a matter of fact, if you send a request to my ministry to receive healing prayer for trauma, you're going to get one of those folks. I mean, they've done not only individual prayer, but they actually do group prayer. And they've done it in South Africa, New Zealand, Asia, uh, Myanmar, uh, Israel, all over the world, as well as here in the United States. So it's very effective on Zoom. So I would say, yes, go for it. There is no distance in the Holy Spirit, just saying. In discerning whether it is um, trauma or a deliverance, how would you know if the person isn't talking, um, but they're there, they just don't, they don't talk, they become mute because of the trauma or something um, I would assume it's trauma because they're not talking. They don't remember anything. Well, if, if so, here, here's what I would do. Is the first thing is I would say is, okay, you're not talking to me. Are you willing to at least receive prayer from me? See, I, here's the thing that I've learned. In order for Jesus to heal them, they don't need to know what their trauma is. And you don't need to know what their trauma is. Jesus knows and that's all that counts. So I begin to pray over any trauma and any blocked memories in their mind to be freed in Jesus' name. Now, right now, I'm in the process of developing uh, a, a whole article on generational trauma that many of us carry generational trauma where we can't identify personally what that trauma is, but there's research that proves that our DNA is actually rewritten by the trauma that happened to our parents, our grandparents, to the third and fourth generations. So what we've done is we've just started when they don't, they can't come up with any trauma, then many times as the Holy Spirit leads us, we may just go after generational trauma and just speak healing to the DNA and command the DNA to be free of trauma in Jesus' name. You're welcome. Hold on to the mic, Greg. Yes, you know, I'm analyzing Jesus Christ ministry and I had the teaching on it. The Jesus, he didn't ask deep, deep blue what happened. He says, pick up your bed and walk. You know, yep. go get this uh, eyes clean. Yep. You know, mm -hmm. he never went go deep. deep. Well, whose sin is that? Who's seen? Yeah, Let's right. not. He never did that. That's and right. that's, oh, how can you reconcile? Because that's a new, uh, because they teach, he was like, most he did cast out demons. Yep. And Samaritan woman, you had four husbands yep. and mm -hmm. uh, yep. that's it. And then he just declared the word yep. and promise and healing. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Next question. So as someone who knows about being healed from trauma, if you're working with someone who is very skeptical about healing, they're happy to receive ministry and prayer, but they're unsure about being healed. How do you combat that? Like t telling them, explaining to them like how that is. Like would, do they still receive that even if they're doubting it, being skeptical? Sure, they do. 
Because most people that I pray with are skeptical. They have, they, have, they have some level of understanding. And if they're desperate enough to let you pray for them, God loves, despera God loves desperation. And if you're actually open to receive it, then yes, there is an element of faith that is important. But um, all of us have doubts. We all, how many of you know that little voice is saying, ah, this isn't going to work, this isn't going to happen? Anybody know that little voice, that little devil voice? So, you know, just go for it anyway and love on them. Love, see, ultimately, guys, this is a ministry of love. We are those who have known trauma, bringing the promise of healing trauma to others. And we do it through the power of God's love, which is what it's all about. Yes, ma'am. For those who are believers, strong believers, and they continue to um, push back on your trying to be helpful, like a family member, for example, at what point do you, or what is your recommendation on dealing with those types of individuals? The hardest person to minister to is a member of your own family. So that's where we have conversations. We have conversations about what we've learned and let them know about resources that are available. Lead them to my, to the Living Unbroken, uh, the Living Unbroken uh, uh, ep you know, episodes. Lead them to YouTube. You can, if you go to YouTube and look up Mike Hutchings, comma, PTSD, there are probably 50 videos on there of me teaching about different things about trauma. And just tell them to go there and look it up and research themselves. But it'll be, unless they say, and once again, guys, let me say this. You cannot go to somebody and say, you know what? You've got trauma. I can pray for you. You want to be healed of trauma? It doesn't work that way. They have to come to you. They have to want to be healed rather than you. Now, if you're praying for somebody physically, physical healing, and the Lord says there might be some trauma involved, then that might be the moment to say, you know what? Is there any trauma like with fibromyalgia? Is there any trauma that's happened in your life? But guys, you're not called to go searching for everybody with trauma. As a matter of fact, during impartation, you're going to get impartation to become a divine magnet that people will come to you. But we'll get to that in a few minutes. Hi there. Hi. I'm, I'm sorry I missed yesterday, um, but I, uh, so if I am like in the transition of uh, probably needing the, the prayer for trauma in order to get to the point where uh, to help people, like do you, do all I need to do is just go to your website or whatever so you're going to get, get the prayer, prayer in just a couple minutes. Oh, okay. I'm going oh, to pray okay. for everybody corporately oh, okay. here in just a few minutes, and I'm going to demonstrate the prayer by praying for you all. Okay, okay? thank you. And then there are videos of me actually praying the prayer that you can look to and continue to look at those examples of how to pray for them. But the first thing we're going to do is, I'm not saying you have trauma, but we're going to get you healed first, and then we're going to go from there, okay? There we go. Hi, just my uh, thank you. I have a two question. First question is um for the uh, non-believer and uh, how can we start that they don't know Jesus? And... Intercede, intercede that they're open to receive. Pray for them that uh -huh. the grace of God would let them be open to receive, mm -hmm. and and then you know you can have conversations with a non-believer as well and say you know what I went to this seminar and this guy was talking about how God heals trauma and he's got all these testimonies and mm -hmm. things like that which actually might make them thirsty you know being salt might make them thirsty to want to explore the God that heals trauma okay thank you second question it is uh, for the adults who has been through a lot of uh, childhood trauma but it's been a long time so they haven't been used in this uh, adult age shall we just use the current um, model yes. or you use the different? yes it, it this covers any stage of development where there's been trauma yep yeah, thank hi you. Hi, um, half of my question is answered. So okay. I'll, I'll ask Can we you move this. on to the next person? No. no okay. No, this is the other. This is the other half. Okay. Um, you know the Bible says that um, if there is a deliverance, and they are not a believer and they don't fill their temple with the with with the Lord, 
then uh, in Jesus Christ, the Lord, then seven more powerful demons are going to come in. So that's a real concern for me because, um, praise the Lord, my son came to the Lord. Mm -hmm. So we're slowly getting him there, yeah. but he's in the right place for it, mm -hmm. for a deliverance. And yeah. he said he was willing mm -hmm. once he comes to California <clears throat> with me. So that's why I'm here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but I have friends, a lot of them, with demons all over the place. Okay. And they are, and I know that's where God wants me. This is, mm -hmm. God's bringing them to me. Yep. And I, I, I am afraid that those, de you know, the seven demons are going to come into All them. Right, so, so I'm praying for their willingness. Mm -hmm. I have friends who say they're, quote, Christians. They don't believe in the Bible. What do I do? Well, I'm looking for desperate people that want to be free of their trauma. And part of that journey of desperation is to welcome Jesus into their life to be Lord. You're right about the, the, the thing that Jesus said, that if you cast a demon out and you don't fill it up with something else, seven more will come. So that's why I don't do deliverance over unbelievers in any way, shape, or form. I don't do it at all. However, at the end of the prayer that I'll walk you through in just a minute, one of the things at the very end we pray, we have the person pray, Holy Spirit, come and fill every area of my life that has been occupied by trauma. Fill me with your love, peace, and joy, and your power. Because wherever trauma has left, now we want the Holy Spirit to come in and fill that. So that's very important. Gonna I'm going to show you in just a minute. Yep. Hi. Um, so you spoke on praying over your child while they're sleeping, right? Um, so I have a question. What about, it's very clear we have authority over our own children's spiritual life, right? So what about, like, if we have a goddaughter or a godson, is it, are we given spiritual authority over, um, like, to be able to pray over them while they're sleeping and it to be properly effective? I think you can do this over any child. Okay. I don't care who it is. Uh, as, even as a foster parent, you know, you've been given temporary authority over the child, but you can still pray over them and minister to them. So I think you can do that over any child. Also, um, so a lot of people who have gone through trauma, sometimes they end up as like an empty shell once they're released, right? So what is, like for instance, like let's say youth ministry in a, like a problem area, not a problem area, but yeah, I mean, where a lot of youth are going through trauma, like if you lead them through this prayer and then they go right back into a household that is not necessarily okay. very... Okay, and I understand your question now. So first of all, no, they're not left as an empty shell. Uh -huh. We let the Holy Spirit fill them Amen. with his love, joy, and peace, and power, and they're filled with the love of God. Secondly, as they go back into traumatizing uh, places like their home or other place, you first of all, first of all make them make sure that they process with you what's going on. But secondly, you help them learn how to pray this prayer over themselves. You see, we want to empower people to not have to come to us all the time to receive prayer, but they can actually, can, even, even teenagers, can, can connect with God and pray these prayers over themselves and get free of all the trauma that's going on. Like I said, I can't promise anybody in this room a trauma-filled life, but what I can tell you is that you don't have to live in the trauma for the rest of your days. Jesus will heal you and restore you, but he will fill you as well with his love and power. Greg? Another quick question? Um, yeah, I think uh, you're talking about um, praying over um, people and I think keeping eye contact. Uh -huh. And um, I mean, this is over trauma, but it could be any healing or deliverance. So um, I just want you to clarify also, like, so you mean keep eye contact, you mean keep your eye open, right? Yes. As you're praying. So I've heard two schools on that, and I want to know what you think. I, um, some people say keep your eyes open so you can see the reaction, yada, yada. Then you can react to what the Holy Spirit's doing. But then I also heard recently, um, and I think a lot of Christians play with their eyes open, I mean eyes closed. And I've heard about the eyes closed thing was that, well, you should keep your eyes closed because you want to hear what the Holy Spirit's saying and you don't want to be distracted by the outside stimuli. So what is, what's your thinking on that? I'm not saying that you can't pray with your eyes closed when you're in personal personal prayer or devotions. That's not, not what I'm saying. I'm saying in a ministry time 
when the focus is on getting healed of trauma or physical healing, I have learned from the Holy Spirit that it's better to keep our eyes open and focus because the focus, see, if, I, if somebody has a lot of severe trauma, they close their eyes, I may have my eyes open watching them, but I have no clue what's going on inside of there and how they're being. See, you can be, how many of you know you can be distracted by stuff going on inside of you and voices that are going on? Whereas if you keep your eyes open and focused, you're going to be focused on the healing prayer that's going on right then, which is what I want them to do. I don't want this to be a three hour long prayer meeting where I'm trying to keep them focused. I want them focused right there on the power of healing prayer. Yes, ma'am. Hi. So um, I'm thinking after this session, I've been to different conferences, and I go back home by myself. What do I do when triggers come and floods come, and what's your advice for me when I'm by myself home? The church is not even equipped to do help okay. on trauma. What do I do then? Well, I would say, first of all, don't stay by yourself. Ask the Lord to lead you to a church that is a safe place that will love you and express the love of God, number one. You can't, you, you, it is not God's desire or will that we walk this out by ourselves, number one. Number two, you have a handout that has the prayer in it. And I, what I recommend that people do after, I, after we walk through this prayer, that you take this prayer model home and you begin to use it as a model of prayer over yourself. This does not replace your intimate walk with Jesus, but it is helping you walk through the, the issues that the Holy Spirit brings up. And as you walk through these, sometimes on a daily basis, it will help you realize the freedom that you're stepping into in Jesus' name. One of the things I want to say, I'm going to answer, everybody who's standing, I'll answer your questions, and then I'm going to go into prayer. But let me, let me say this real quick. M most of you will not experience the positive effects of the prayer I'm going to pray over you today. But you'll go to bed tonight and you'll sleep better than you have in years. You'll wake up in the morning and you'll feel better about your life and you may have some pain go out of you. But understand that most of the effects of this prayer, we don't get testimonies from people to get instantly healed the minute I pray for them. But instead it's 24, it's 36, it's 48, it's a week, it's two weeks later that people say to me, oh my gosh, my life is really different because I'm not reacting in the way I don't have fear, I don't have panic anymore. So understand that, that you're going to walk through a process of seeing what the Lord has done and bringing healing and freedom to you. Yes, ma'am. So my good session, thank you. Wanted to ask about, you talked about inflammation and different afflictions. So I have inflammation. Does that, is that, do you think that's uh, connected to some trauma? I would say that trauma is one of the causes of inflammation. There may be other organic causes, but let me say this to you. If you've been to a doctor and the doctor can't pinpoint the cause of your inflammation, it could be trauma. And so I'd just ask the Holy Spirit. I'd pray through the prayers and see what happens. I mean, somebody asked me, I'll just go ahead and answer this question. Somebody said, well, what if you have a dog that's traumatized? Can you pray this prayer? <laughs> and I said, a dog. What if you have a dog that's traumatized? And I say, you know what? I haven't done it yet, but go for it. See what happens. <laughs> no, I'm dead serious. Go for it and see what happens. I mean, the, God loves the dog, right? I mean, come on. So why not? A few questions. Yes, First one. Maybe just your one best question. Yeah. Let Okay, what if you're praying for someone and then Holy Spirit points something that's in you that needs healing? What if you're praying for somebody and the Holy Spirit shows you there's something else that wants healing? In you that needs healing. In me? Yeah. Well, you know what? I didn't get, first of all, let me say this to you. Um, all of us need healing in something. And you're not disqualified from doing this if you still need further healing. So what I would say to Holy Spirit at that point is, Holy Spirit, remind me again later when we're in our private time. No, I'm, I'm dead serious. Because we may be praying for somebody and he, we're dealing with something in this person's life and you'll hear, oh my gosh, I'm dealing with that too. Well, that doesn't immediately disqualify you. It's just his love saying, let's deal with this later, son, daughter. Yeah. 
Go for it. Yep. Yeah, I know that this is about healing prayer, but I know that God can heal trauma through therapies like prolonged exposure, right, and things like that. So I can see how they go hand in hand, right? So I just wanted to get your take on that because with prolonged exposure, you know, you're avoiding the avoiding or you're going back to that place with that was traumatic. Like if there was a water accident, you might go to the beach or so. Mm -hmm. Just want to get your take. I mean, I see both as very valid. I mean, this is even more Listen, so. Listen, I think prolonged spiritual. exposure. I think prolonged exposure. I think EMDR. I think a lot of the different modes of treatment are helpful for people to step out of their post-traumatic responses and reactions. When it's a trauma that has wounded your soul, the only thing that hap the only thing that heals your soul is the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can use all of those as wonderful treatments and help. And I think prolonged exposure, going back to the beach where there's been a water accident, is very helpful. And also will, you'll find out whether or not God has healed your memory because whether or not you'll even have the memory of that incident anymore, you may not because that's what we've experienced. Yes, ma'am. Just a quick question. Do you have this in Spanish, your card? I do, as a matter of fact. So if you'll send me an email, I'll send you a copy of the handout in Spanish. And we have these two, and that's it. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, if you have a special needs person in your life that are physically an adult, but mentally they're young, under 11 or 12, what, how would you pray for them? Well, I would still pray for them at night, but then I would also, if they can conceptualize the trauma that they've been through, and if they can talk about it, if they can't, then I'd pray for them at night. If they can't, then I'd pray for them at night. Last question. I just wanted to let you know that you know, I've read your book multiple times, and in the very back, if you have YouTube places you can go to yes. look at videos. Over half of those don't exist anymore. Because okay. I read, because I read the book Thank the, last, you. the fourth time I read it was a month ago, and there were over half of them that. You well, that's good to know because the anymore. publisher is supposed to maintain those YouTube <laughs> for me, so I get to talk to my publisher about that. But uh, listen, go to on YouTube, go to Mike Hutchings, comma PTSD, and it should have all those links. So anyway, okay, everybody, put your stuff down. We're going to go a few minutes over here. But that, if that's okay with you guys. Everybody smile at me for a minute, will you? Just let me see that you're alive and here. That's good. Thank you, Jesus. I tell my student, Chrissy will tell you, whenever I get ready to, uh, to give a hard truth to my students, I'll say, everybody smile. Now, there's a, this thing called a deep cleansing breath. And what a deep cleansing breath is, is that you breathe in through your nose very deeply. You hold it for about a second, and then you push it out of your mouth. So I want everybody, because of the stress of just being here all day, I just want to bring a... I mean, it's stressful being here all day. i am be honest with you. So anyway, but I want you to bring a release to your physical body as we step into this place. So we're going to do a deep cleansing breath. Breathe in through your nose. One, two, three. Breathe in. Breathe out. Now, I want you to keep your eyes on me as I pray for you. I'm not able to keep eye contact with everybody in this room at the same time because I do not have eyes in the back of my head. But I, I can still look at you as I'm praying. But when I see you all get religious and close your eyes, I'm going to tell you, open your eyes. <laughs> so Holy Spirit, I just thank you for your presence in this room right now. I thank you that we don't have to be anything except who we are. And I thank you, Father, that as the, you have been moving through our time together today, that people have already begun to experience healing and freedom in Jesus' name. So Holy Spirit, I ask you to come in power. Now, I have already interviewed you about your trauma, step one. And step two, uh, I'm going to ask for your permission to pray for you, to pray for your entire being to release trauma. If I have your permission, please say yes. yes. 
So by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I declare over you in Jesus' name that you are completely forgiven by God according to the authority of Scripture that if you've welcomed Jesus Christ into your life to be your Savior and you've accepted the work of the cross, then every sin that you've ever committed is completely forgiven in Jesus' name. There is nothing between you and Father God you are completely free of all the sin that you've ever done in your life in the name of Jesus. And now as Jesus encouraged us in the prayer he gave his disciples, as we have been forgiven, as, that, as we have been forgiven of our debts and trespasses before God, now God calls us to forgive everybody who has ever hurt or wounded us. And we do this simply by closing our eyes. So I give everybody permission to close your eyes right now. And we're going to ask Holy Spirit to show you anybody who has ever hurt or wounded you in any way. And as those faces or those names come to your attention, we're going to pray silently, Father, I forgive them. You forgive them. I release them. We're just going to pray, Father, I forgive them, you forgive them, I release them. Now, you can do them as a whole group, or you can do them one at a time, whatever you need to do. But we're going to take just a couple moments of quietness and let you do your business with God. And then when you're done, open your eyes so that we can move on. Thank you, Jesus. And as you walk through this process, if you get to a stuck place where you don't feel like you have the will to do it, call upon the grace of God that forgave you to forgive. He will give it to you. Father, I forgive them. You forgive them. I release them in Jesus' name. I'm going to give you one more minute. Open your eyes. Say this one more time with me. Father, I forgive them. You forgive them. I release them. In Jesus' name. Now let me continue to pray for you. By the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I break the power of all shame off of your life right now. I declare to you that there is nothing about you that carries any shame. You have nothing to be ashamed of in Jesus' name because the j blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed your identity from any shame about who you are in the name of Jesus. I are, again declare there is no guilt over you, that God is not punishing you through this trauma, but instead there is no guilt. You're completely free of guilt. And in Jesus' name, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that you are completely free of all condemnation. There is nothing hopeless about you. But the Word of God says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death in Jesus' name. So no more shame, guilt, or condemnation 
in the name of Jesus. Now, by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I sever every work of darkness that is against you, that has come through the trauma that you experienced in Jesus' name. I specifically, by the blood of Jesus Christ, I cancel the assignments of the spirit of trauma, the spirit of torment, and the spirit of fear in Jesus' name. Make this declaration with me. I'm going to say it. You repeat it. God has not given me a spirit of fear. But of power, love, and a sound mind. Power, love, and sound mind. I have a sound mind. I have a sound because mind. I have the mind of Christ. I mind of Christ. Therefore, I think God's thoughts, Therefore, I think God's thoughts. And I'm not going crazy. And I'm going to keep praying for you. In the name of Jesus, I sever and I cancel every attack and work of the spirit of suicide, of the spirit of death, and the spirit of addictions in Jesus' name. I declare every one of those demonic spirits access to you is closed by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, and there is freedom. I also break the power of the spirit of anger and rage and anxiety in the name of Jesus. I declare they no longer have any effect or attachment to you in Jesus' name, and that you are free right now in Jesus' name by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, for the, all of you who have been sexually violated or assaulted or in some way been in a sexual relationship that brought abuse to you, by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I sever every soul tie and every one flesh union between you and those that abused you or assaulted you in any way, shape, or form in Jesus' name. I close the door of access to the demonic spirits of lust, of perversion, and of pornography that came into your life through that soul tie. And in Jesus' name, we declare that the chains between you and that ev those events are broken off of you and that you are completely free by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now take your right hand and put it on your chest. In Jesus' name, I speak healing to your soul in the name of Jesus. I speak healing to your mind, to your will, and to your emotions in the name of Jesus. I command restoration of the original dream and identity that God dreamed for you before you were conceived in your mother's womb in Jesus' name. And I declare the shalom of God over you. That is wholeness of soul. That even as you saw that piece of broken pottery put back together with gold lacquer, and as you saw the picture of the broken heart put together with veins or gold, God is bringing the gold of heaven into your soul right now. And many of you are beginning to experience a heat under your hands. That's the shalom of God. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in you that is confirming for you the, the healing and restoration of your soul by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now take that same right hand and put it on the back side of your head. Keep looking at me. Don't close your eyes. And in the name of Jesus, I command every traumatic image and memory that still resides in your mind to dry up and die right now in Jesus' name. I command the neural pathways that lead to those traumatic images and memories to be severed right now in Jesus' name. And I command your five senses, your seeing, your smelling, your tasting, touching, and hearing to be severed from triggering any of those memories or lies. I command every lie, every lid, and every label that came in through that traumatic event or those traumas to dry up and die in the name of Jesus. And I speak to your memory center to wake up, wake up, wake up. Let there come a free flow of memory through your brain. Let there come a re restoration of short-term memory in Jesus' name. And you'll begin to remember the good things about your life, going all the way back to your childhood in Jesus' name. And all of the bad memories and images, the Lord is removing and replacing it with joy in Jesus' name. I also speak 
to your sleep center in the name of Jesus. And I declare the promise of Proverbs 3.24 that says, because you walk in covenant with God, you shall no longer lie down in fear, but it's your father's inheritance to you to give you sweet sleep. So there's a resetting of your circadian rhythms back to pre-trauma levels, and you'll begin to experience sweet sleep every night by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. I also declare that every lie, every stronghold, and every image that has been set up because of this trauma come down, and you will begin to have the ability to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ in Jesus' name. Now put your hand right back here again. And in the name of Jesus, I speak to every system of your body that has experienced trauma. I speak to your skeletal muscular system that the muscle memory still retains trauma from your abuse or your accidents or any trauma that you've experienced. And in Jesus' name, I command the muscle memory to release that trauma now in the name of Jesus. I speak to your endocrine system for every part of your endocrine system to be healed and restored back to pre-trauma function in Jesus' name. And I specifically speak in this room to people who are experiencing adrenal fatigue. And in the name of Jesus, I command healing to the adrenal glands in Jesus' name and restoration and a restoration of the acceptable and right levels of adrenaline and cortisol that there would come shalom to your entire endocrine system to be healed in the name of Jesus. For those of you that knew sexual abuse and assault, that the Lord would remove any trauma from your reproductive system, from your genitalia, from any part of you that experienced that in Jesus' name, that you would carry no more trauma in those areas of your body any longer in the name of Jesus. Now pray this prayer with me. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit come, and fill come and fill every area of my life, every area of my life that, has trauma, that has been occupied by trauma. My soul my spirit, my, spirit, my, body. my body, I receive, I receive healing, from healing from trauma, and I receive from you, receive from you your, love, your love, your peace, your, peace, your, joy, your joy, and your power. And your power. I, receive I receive freedom, freedom from, a heart, from a broken heart, and I declare, I, declare I, walk I walk with a restored soul, a restored soul in Jesus' name. Now, everybody stand up. And the very last thing we do is we reset your identity according to what God says about you. And you will see on the bottom of your handout a new creation declaration. You don't have to go to there now. I'm going to lead you through it. But listen to me. This is what you want to start speaking over yourself every day as you've been freed from this trauma. So I'm going to say it and you repeat it. I am a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. All things have become new. I am in Jesus. Jesus is in me. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I am loved. I'm accepted. I'm forgiven. I'm adopted into God's family. I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. Therefore, as all power is under the feet of Jesus, it's under my feet. I am adopted into God's family, and I am a co-heir with Jesus. That means everything Jesus gets, I have a share in. In Jesus' name. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm becoming more and more like Jesus every day. Because all things, all things, all things work together for my good. Because I'm loved by God. And I'm called according to his purpose. I am no longer a victim. But I'm more than an overcomer. Because of his love. And his purpose for me in Jesus' name. Now give thanks to God, will you? Hallelujah.
Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, one last thing we're going to do, and this is our impartation moment. Impartation means that whatever grace, gifting, anointing God has given me to bring healing to trauma goes to the army of heart healer and chain breakers that God is raising up in this area. Because you've been part of this seminar, you are part of that army. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to actually reach out and put a hand on a shoulder or put, put your hands, either join hands, to every person in every row. I want there to be connection throughout this entire room. Some of you are going to have to do it between the rows so that we can be connected together because I'm going to use these guys right here as my point of contact <laughs> in Jesus' name. Everybody get connected right now. If you're not connected yet, make it happen. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Father, I do this out of your mandate to me to multiply everything that I have received from you to everybody that wants to receive it. So in Jesus' name, whatever grace gifting and anointing God has given me to bring healing and freedom to trauma I give to everyone in this room right now by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ let the spirit of God come now and let there come the fire of God that will confirm the anointing and the freedom of Holy Spirit that he's given to every person in this room in Jesus name and with it will come a gift of faith that everybody you pray for who carries trauma, if they ask for prayer, they will be healed in Jesus' name. So let the fire of God come to bring freedom, to be men and women of God who go forth and set the captives free, declare freedom to the prisoners, and to declare their new identity of who they are in Jesus Christ. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Give thanks to God, will you? Greg, you want to come?